Okay, so just continuing on marketing, you know, now I'm going to summarize for the first 10 or 15 slides pretty much what we have done till now. And it's going to help you for the assignment that you're going to be doing. So, you know, where do startups go wrong and what are the things that really matter? And as an entrepreneur, like, you know, most entrepreneurs are struggling with there's a nice balance, balance bar where it's like, you know, do I get the product to market right now or do I wait for some features and do I stay in, um, in you know, um, in secret till, till uh, everything is ready. This is something that all entrepreneurs struggle. Should I launch a product now or will the competition kill me because they got the idea? So there are five things that really matter. Understanding the unmet need, which is the burning need. We've talked about that many times. How big is this opportunity, right? How big is this thing that you're going after? Can you really develop either technology or marketing advantage or funding advantage or something or the other to get a sustainable competitive positioning? Uh, can you create a scalable business? And why us or why now? Why now? So I'll, I'll just tell you guys uh, something that just came up uh, this week. So my son, Sujay, like, you know, he was the CEO, CFO at Dropbox. And then after four years, he left that and then raised a fund called Wonderco with uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg from DreamWorks. You guys have heard of DreamWorks? along Steven Spielberg guy. So this guy was the president of uh, DreamWorks. So Jeffrey Katzenberg and Sujay partnered up and decided to raise a, a fund. So they raised $500 million from all over the world uh, to fund technology companies and media companies. And uh, they just did that last year. And uh, they we saw it, I saw it in the press, or you can see it online, that uh, they have just uh, decided to fund a new startup. And the new startup is called New TV. So with New TV, essentially, um, they are trying to create a whole new way of providing entertainment to the whole world. And so new TV is based on what is called short form TV on smartphones. So the whole concept is that, you know, TV typically you've got a 30 minute or one hour show. But if you look at it, their idea is that the whole show should be in short form. Uh, 30 seconds to maybe three or four minutes. In three or four minutes, you should have the entire TV show. Not this 30 minutes, one hour TV show, I mean, and so on, right? It's like T20, but played in T20 balls, not T20 <laughs> wickets, not 20, 20 overs, but you play in 20 balls, right? Imagine the most exciting part of T20 is the last 20 balls, right? So they're saying, why play all those other balls? Let's just play the last 20 balls, right? And so, <clears throat> and the same thing for music, same thing for entertainment, same thing for shows or whatever, because they found that um, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who's kind of a brilliant, you know, entertainment, you know, expert, he said, you know, there's something about YouTube. People are watching, nobody ever watches a one hour show on YouTube anymore. Everybody just goes and wants to watch that 30 minute, 30 second, one, hour, one minute, two minutes, three minutes. Tell me what the joke is, you know. <laughs> Don't tell me. Give me 30 minutes of the comedian coming on the stage and doing this and that. But the funniest part of the joke, tell me that quickly, right? So, so basically, he said that, you know, the new people all have, want everything quickly. And they don't have too much time to waste. <laughs> so... He said, TV also needs to adapt to this new, you know, uh, cultural behavior by people all over the world. 
and then of course smart TV right you don't need to have it on a big screen anymore. So it should be portable, it should be high intensity, fast, easy to get to, it, you know get your kicks, move on to the next thing right. So he wants to develop a platform, then he wants to develop the studios, he wants to find the actors, actresses and and people that will create this content, directors, everything, he wants to create a whole uh, platform, ecosystem for creating short form TV for uh, people to enjoy. For, uh, probably, I think it's, he just came up, they just launched it, they just hired Meg Whitman to become the CEO, you know, she was the CEO of eBay and she took eBay from 40 million dollars to 8 billion dollars in revenue over 18 years. So they brought her in to be the CEO of this new company. It's just an idea right now. No, no technology, no studios, no nothing. And uh, they have decided to raise 2 billion dollars. <laughs> so, so, so you know, just as you guys are starting your companies, there is somebody else in the US also starting a company and uh, they're also starting from scratch. They're at the same place where you are. They have to write the BMC, they have got to write the, but I just felt that, you know, you should know that, you know, you can't, that the, right in front of your eyes, there is a whole new entertainment ecosystem that is being funded. Uh, and, uh, you know, my son Sujay and Jeffrey Katzenberg, are funding this new uh, company called New TV for, uh, what do you guys think? <laughs> Even for music. So if you have Zakir Hussain, instead of watching it, 45 sec 45 minutes for his raga to develop till you get to the high speed you just go straight to the high speed <laughs> no but you know if you would listen to the high speed tabla playing right if you if, if you saw it that would be more exciting right so yeah I, I personally think that you know these guys have identified you know a need right so the unmet need is there, right? Because today you can't find a whole bunch of content, you know, well organized, well curated. Uh, so the unmet need was there. Um, big opportunity, right? How big is the opportunity? Global market, so like at least two billion viewers, um, basically, um, you know, if they can have people watching their new TV segments for one hour a day, you know, uh, how big is that market between ad market and everything? So massive opportunity, uh, sustainable competitive positioning. So if they had funded it with $10 million, could they have managed to get a sustainable competitive advantage? Probably not because, you know, by the time, you know, a lot of people can put $10 million in, right? So now when they say that you're going to put in $2 billion, even the biggest companies like Disney and, and you know, uh, CBS and ABC and CNN are all going to say, should I invest that two billion? <laughs> it becomes like a, it becomes like a massive challenge, right? So, you know, if these guys can, if uh, New TV can go ahead and, you know, in one year or year and a half, or maybe even faster, if they can launch something, get a brand name, get people to start loading in that new TV app, downloading the new TV app and on all their smartphones worldwide, Android as well as uh, this thing. If they can be um, 
if there can be a default app on all smartphones, then automatically they've taken the market, right? Because nobody's going to want to have two apps. So I'll just give you a quick insight. Like, you know, like there were so many companies doing uh, file sharing on the cloud. You know, Dropbox is not that amazing an idea, right? It's just uploading a file and sharing it, right? So, uh, so there were lots of companies doing it. And then Sujay was the VP of business development. And so he said, how do I separate out from everybody else? So he and the CEO flew to Samsung one day. You know, suddenly he's gone. I said, where are you going, Sujay? He said, no, we are going. So they flew to Samsung in Korea. And then after one or two weeks, they come back and they've got a deal with Samsung as the business partner to be the default app for all file storage on Samsung smartphones. What happened? Automatically, they became the leader, right? So automatically, every quarter, they started getting 30 million new users, and which means 100, 120 million new users per, 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 per year. And you know, in three years or four years, they had half a billion users, and now they're the number one. And that, just that one deal, exploded the value of Dropbox from half a billion to $10 billion. One deal, one partnership. And uh, based on that, Sujay raised a billion dollars for Dropbox. So now he's got the money, he's got the default you know, position on every smartphone, and uh, you know, kind of took the market from the competition. So, Sustainable competitive positioning, you know, you can do it with the help of partners, you can do it with bold aggressive funding, you can do it with branding, you can, there's many different ways of getting sustainable competitive positioning. Scalable business, definitely scalable, right? You can have all kinds of new TV short form videos, right? Sports, ethnic, entertainment, uh, uh, politics, news, uh, war, whatever. And why us, why now? So again, it's because Katzenberg has got a great name in entertainment. By getting in Meg Whitman, they've got somebody who can build a massive company. Uh, and, um, and, and their uh, offices in Hollywood in the right place for getting all the studios and others to team up with them. So, so you can see how, you know, a real startup, you know, which was nowhere, it wasn't even there uh, three days ago. This, this thing came, came out just three days ago. You can watch it on, you can check it on your phones later on. New TV, N-E-W TV, yeah. Okay, so clearly, there was an unmet need, and without that hair on fire, without identifying people with that. See, did you know about this unmet need till today? You use smartphones every day, you use YouTube every day, you use, you use Snapchat, you use uh, Instagram. But you didn't recognize the unmet need, right? See, that is what, and these are like, earth-shaking, global, you know, behavior-changing uh, insights. But now if you come up with the idea and start, you might still be okay because you'll do it in India. Maybe you can quickly grab a whole bunch of content and everything and you can get something done. Uh, and then maybe new TV might have to buy you out or something, right? So, but the thing is that, you know, this unmet need is, because there is nobody else providing this content, right, today. Everybody is kind of solving the problem themselves, randomly. But there is no organized way. I know like when I'm on YouTube and I'm watching, say, you know, um, some sports, some sports or music or whatever, you know, YouTube keeps giving me new clips to watch, new clips to watch, new clips to watch, right? 
And you know, before I know it, one hour, two hours have gone, just watching the clips one after the other, the recommendation engine is giving me. And, uh, but you know, I don't want to watch anything that's more than five or 10 minutes, you know. It, it, so I immediately will say, oh, I've heard this song, then go to the next song, right, you know. So this unmet need was there. They found a big opportunity. Uh, they looked at the market, probably bottoms up, tops down which is what you'll be doing. So tops down is where you look at the total market, how many smartphones are there, how many minutes or hours or how many video clips people are gonna watch, how much is the ad potential uh, for these video clips. Remember YouTube is now a super profitable company. You know, just making money from the ads on each of these short form videos that they've got. So clearly, so you can look, generate your, your business model tops down, and then you can also do it bottoms up, where you can say, okay, these are the you know, 10,000 customers in, in the Malibu area or Hollywood area. This is how much they, will, they have told me they're gonna use, and then I scale up to all of Los Angeles, then all of California, then all of US, all of Europe, then all of the world, right? India, then China. So, is it a billion dollar market? You guys think new TV is a billion dollar market? Huh? Automatic. <laughs> Don't even have to question it. It's just gonna be a billion dollar market, right? And, and, and the thing is that most of us think, how can there be a billion dollar market that nobody has figured out? We think about that all the time. Even I, I, me too. I mean, I'm as, to me, it's mind boggling to think that another billion dollar market will show up. But it did show up. And none of us here seems to have a doubt that if new TV executes properly, and if YouTube and Facebook and others don't jump in and out execute them, uh, they, they have a chance of being worth, like Snapchat, 20 billion, 40 billion in two years, three years. How long do you think it'll be before they're worth 10 billion or 20 billion dollars? Yeah, it's that short. From idea to market valuation of 10 billion to 20 billion dollars. Yeah, so. Uh, Anyway, so the total addressable market is there, third market, and you know, now that you know about this, you should start tracking it and see what they launch in three months, what they launch in six months, whether they give you the opportunity to develop your own thing, because whenever a new platform comes out, it automatically opens up a lot of opportunities for other entrepreneurs to jump on. See, when a billion dollar new ecosystem comes along, you know, you can also get a piece of the action by being the first to take the content that maybe you are good at or, or you think there's a market segment need for. Like people who successfully manage, just do a search on YouTube for who are the top 50 producers on YouTube. Has anybody done a search? You can do a search for the top 50 producers. You've done search? Have you done a search? Huh? Yeah, they produce video every week or every two days. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I think the number one category, believe it or not, is um, fashion tips for, for girls, you know. And there are these young girls who are not even 18 years old, who are now the top producers on YouTube. And they show you how to trim your eyebrows, how to cut your hair, how to you know, get rid of pimples, you know. And they, they, they basically put this video up right from their home. And they've got a little setup. They, they take the video with their own cameras, etc and they are making more than a million dollars a week 
from their home, they're not even 18 years old. Because they identified a market segment. And each of these clips is five to 10 minutes. You know? But each clip has 20 million or 30 million views. Each clip has, uh, and some of them have got 100 million views. And so, you know, now when this platform, New TV, comes up, you know, there's going to be a race to develop your channel on New TV, right? Whoever develops, successfully develops their channel, then as New TV does their multi billion dollar marketing launches and all kinds of stuff, like, you know, automatically you get. You know, just like, I mean, they became famous not only because of themselves, but because YouTube promoted them also. See, it's like success breeds success. That's how life works, you know. YouTube gets more viewers among the young people because they promote videos from this person. And this person makes more money, which, you know, generates more momentum for them. So it's, it's, a, it's a, you know. So, you know, here's the market, and this is how you go ahead and figure out, you know, your market segmentation and all that. Uh, again, I think we have talked about this. There are three different kinds of, uh, or four different kinds of uh, new startups. So the, it can be a totally new market. It can be an existing market. It can be a niche market or you resegment the market. So where do you think new TV fits in? Is it a new market or resegmenting the market? Or a niche market? Or an existing market with a faster, better, cheaper solution? It's an existing market. Do you think it's existing? Because existing means you're just faster, cheaper, faster on a with it could, I mean, you can actually treat it as that because now it's short form for people do watch videos on the smartphones, right? But you can also think of it as, um, as invention of a new category, right? It's a new category for entertainment of how, you know, people who are being, who used to be entertained in one way now entertain another way, right? Because it's replacing uh, you know, other kinds of entertainment. So anyway, so you have to think through and figure out where do you think, see, a good example of faster, cheaper, better for me was Opti, right? I didn't create a new market. I just got to market before, six months before my competition. And then I used to provide competitive pricing and so on, right? So I was a faster, cheap, a better, faster, cheaper, alternative in the chipset market, right? So, so I, Opti fit in there. With Selectica, we were a totally new market because configuration uh, uh, based on AI and on the internet platform just didn't exist. So we were a new market there. Can you think of a resegmented market? So you resegment the market and then you spin it out as a niche market. So you take an existing market, you cut out a small piece, and then you provide a specialized solution for a niche market. I'm trying to think which one. Can anybody think of that? No, it's, it becomes a niche market. You resegment it. No, it's, it's going to be. It's going to be a new category of entertainment, right? Yeah, my hunch is that, you know, they are not trying to be a niche player. They're trying to be a whole new category. It is also what the entrepreneur wants. What's the desire of the entrepreneur? Does he want to just be a small player? But, you know, when they're investing $2 billion, I don't look at them as a niche player anymore. 
you know, if they had invested even hundred million dollars, it would be a niche player. You know, when you invest two billion dollars, it means that you want to have create the studios, you want to create the marketing and promotion for that, you want to create the environment where developers can automatically develop a content for that and they can be uh, promoted and all kinds of stuff. It's a whole platform they're trying to create. Let's, let's, let's take a look at the consumer market. Um, let's take a look at uh, Patanjali who came up with Ayurvedic uh, toothpaste. Right? He's come up with Ayurvedic toothpaste, Ayurvedic uh, hair shampoo, herbal shampoos, and all kinds of stuff, right? So I look at him as actually resegmenting the market. So he's taking the toothpaste market and he carved out this Ayurvedic, you know, healthy, Indian focused uh, thing and created that niche market. And I just bought from Sakari Bandar Colgate Ayurvedic toothpaste. <laughs> so clearly Colgate wants to compete in that niche market. But for I think two years or so, Patanjali had exclusivity in that Ayurvedic toothpaste market, right? They were the first to kind of own that market or Ayurvedic hair shampoo, Ayurvedic soap, Ayurvedic whatever. Okay, sustainable competitive pricing. Who's the competition? There's going to be all kinds of competitors. You know, I don't see Google just rolling over and not, you know, trying to own that market. I don't see Facebook who wants to be a key player in video, right? Uh, give up that market. And I think that new TV is going to want to become a social media platform for the users too. So they are going to go and compete at some point with the Facebooks of the world and with the Snapchats of the world. So, you know, I think all these competitors are going to wake up in my books. You know, they're going to wake up and uh, they're going to also jump in into this market and then the question of who wins, right? Who, who is going to succeed? in this marketplace. Uh, be different and so on, okay? Okay, so one of the questions that you have to do uh, for Thursday is positioning. So in positioning, it needs to be a defendable, differentiated positioning. You're going to be different than everybody else, You've got to defend, put walls everywhere and you know, something that people can understand what you're all about. So, see that center thing, those two boxes? That's what you've got to fill out. Who is this thing for? Who's the target customer? What is the need of that customer? What is the product name in which category? And what is the key benefit? And why it is better than everybody else? Competitive advantage and then our product and statement of def definition. So you need to prepare one slide which gives this information on that one slide, right? So that's, that'll give you your defendable, differentiated positioning for your product. Okay, scalable business model, that's the BMC. Uh, yeah. For product or service, you can still do it. Like Accenture has got a clear positioning. Booz Allen has got a different positioning. McKinsey has got a different positioning. So all everybody's got a positioning. So in this case, if you are providing something similar, that's the next stage. It is okay if you are different from the other. You will be different because you're going to say, I'm going to focus on consulting opportunities in the chemical industry and South Bombay, or you know, your, your focus, or, or something. Or I'm going to have, you know, some. You're going to be unique somewhere. Otherwise, if you're not differentiated, what's the chance of succeeding? 
how are you going to compete when they, their salesman comes in? They'll walk away with the business. How big do you think McKinsey is? It doesn't. So, so they they focused on strategic consulting on the global two thousand. They charge you know multi million dollars per assignment, and you multiply it out by two thousand customers worldwide, it becomes a multi billion dollar business. You know Accenture is something slightly is not providing strategic consulting. They're providing business consulting. Then there is. People like Infosys, TCS, others, they provide, you know, consulting services for deploying the ideas and solutions that people have. So every consulting company, how big is it? How big are they? They're monsters, right? TCS. So, so basically, when you come up with your idea, you don't want to put a limit. That's the beauty of entrepreneurship. Your vision should be huge because you do something in such a differentiated way, such a defensible way, that you can become successful on a large, large scale. Obviously, you're going to start small. It might take you five years to get there, 10 years to get there. Remember, Infosys started in 1980. And what's interesting, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, oh, Nandan Nilikane was my hostel mate. You know, he was three years junior to me. So Infosys revenues by 1993, 13 years later, were something like, you know, I think 15 or 20 million dollars a year. I had started a company in 1989, Opti, and my revenues were three times larger than Infosys revenue in 1992. And look at where Infosys is today and where Opti is today, right? So. It's all, it, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, obviously they had better execution, they had the better vision, they, okay. It's still there. It has evolved from a product company into what they call the internet troll. Uh, sorry, uh, IP troll. And every year they sell no product. But in the eight or ten years that I was there, we had filed about, you know, eight or ten patents on how to design semiconductors and how to do memory access and things like that. So we had got eight or ten patents. So every year they make about twenty million dollars in royalties from Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, every semiconductor <laughs> computer company pays them close to $20 million on the patents that we had developed. Because since they don't have any products, those big companies cannot sue them. Since this company and this company's patents are being infringed by IBM, by Apple, even Apple is paying them, you know, $20 million to get the license to those eight or ten patents. So these are called patent trolls. So it's become a very profitable, successful company, but in a very unique way. So all kinds of crazy stuff happens, yeah. Yeah, 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 of course. You'll have lots and lots of people. Do. If you're successful with your positioning and your differentiation, you won't be a hundred man company in three years. You'll be probably around thousand, maybe five thousand, with plans to get to twenty thousand, fifty thousand. Sky is the limit. Okay. But the important thing is to get that differentiated, defensible positioning. That's what I want to see from everybody. What is your differentiated, defensible positioning? So, you know, when 
New Kiwi goes, they've got to raise the $2 billion, right? So they're going to go to investors everywhere and say, you know, here is my business plan and this is my positioning. And then they're going to say, what if YouTube comes in? What if Facebook comes in? They already have the users there. You know, they will also, now you've told everybody you're going to do, create a new platform for short form TV. What if they start the studios? Disney, why would Disney give up, you know, their position in the entertainment business to a whole new company? I mean, so Disney just bought Katzenberg's company for four billion dollars, right? DreamWorks was purchased by, from Katzenberg for four billion dollars just two years ago. So Disney will say, you know, I think you came up with the idea when you were still, after they bought them, he had to work as president of Disney DreamWorks division for about 12 months, and then he terminated, separated. So Disney is going to go to him and say, you came up with the idea for new TV while you were at Disney, <laughs> but you never told us you came up with the idea. And they are going to probably file a lawsuit against uh, against new TV for stealing their idea, which was sitting inside Katzenberg's head. Right? It, huh? Uh, it all depends on whether you had to you whether you use their assets to do some MVP. <laughs> if you do an MVP on their money, if you take some of their engineers, if you do that kind of work, then they'll say you developed the whole idea, the whole plan, and everything, and then you walked out. But if you just put the, have the idea in your head, and you didn't tell anybody about it, and so on, and you didn't validate it, and you didn't use the assets and resources, of the parent company, then it's your idea. So IBM and others used to sue engineers if they quit and joined a competitor or started their own company. Because they're saying that that multitasking idea or concurrent processing idea, you, you got it at I IBM. So they used to actually file a lawsuit against these uh, employees who would quit and join the next company. But now in US it's become very clear, you cannot, all the courts ruled against IBM. They said you cannot, whatever's in somebody's head is their idea. You can't, you, just because he's your employee, they didn't become, their brain is not your possession, yeah. You know, they're paying you for, you know, helping you to understand the concurrent processing problem, multitasking problem, whatever it is. But uh, as long as you did not use the company resources to develop the idea, check whether it's a good idea or bad idea, to run experiments on their computers and use up CPU power to validate that blockchain is good or blockchain is bad or, or imp improve the algorithms for blockchain, you can walk away and it's your idea. So all I'm saying is that it's big companies are not going to give up, you know, big business opportunities to entrepreneurs very easily. You know, you're going to have to fight and these guys are going to have to fight to succeed. Just because they came up with a nice idea doesn't mean that, but you know, you can see that they are ambitious, they are bold, they are going to go about it in a tough way. They're going, to, they're going to fight it out and they're going to hopefully succeed. Um, so this is the question that investors are going to ask. Why you? Why should I give you guys two billion dollars? What if, you know, you lose in the court, you know, the lawsuit thing, or you lose, you know, there is some patent that uh, uh, YouTube has got for the speed at which you know things are transferred back and forth for short form TV and the caching that's done and all kinds of stuff, you know these are patterns that you know have locked up, 
high speed, you know, short form video streaming and all that because you know Google got so many uh, patents in, in, all, in every aspect and so does Facebook and so does Microsoft, so does IBM. So you know how are you going to overcome that? You've got no technology, no patents, nothing. How are you going to, so, so these are the questions that entrepreneurs get asked you know when you try to go fund. It doesn't matter who you are. Katzenberg is going to be asked about it. You know, Sujay is going to be asked about it. How are you going to make this into a standard? What kind of business deals do you think you can get done with Samsung? You did it for Dropbox. You did the deal with Samsung for Dropbox. But Samsung is now becoming smaller. Become, Xiaomi has become the big one. Do you have part, relationships with Xiaomi? You know, do you have relationships with Apple? You know, uh, so on, right? So, OK, so you know, when you come up with your idea, your whole ecosystem around you has to sh is shaken up, right? And it's gets, it gets realigned. So the market has a discontinuity, there's regulations, product innovation, behavioral change, everything gets changed up and down. And your marketing strategy is going to be the DNA of your company. It's the one that's going to determine the ultimate success of your company. Okay, so, so let's take a look at what this marketing how to do this kind of marketing. So um, you'll notice that you know this Jeffrey Moore keeps on coming up everywhere because it's one of the best kind of examples, or not I mean best models for how technology gets accepted in the tech world, new technology, right? So you know essentially break up customers into these five segments, techies, visionaries, pragmatic, the pragmatics, conservatives and laggards. And then you go ahead and validate your product, make it perfect with the techies and visionaries. Then you develop all the marketing material and then you get all the big ones to start using it, right? So, and then the conservatives will come and then the laggards. And the, all the profit is really when the pragmatics and the conservatives start using your product. So, so I think we already talked about this, this unmet need and the need to discover that burning need and you have to keep segmenting the market to find who absolutely needs a product. So if again, if you look at new TV, you know, is it going to be music? People wanting to listen to music, people wanting to know about politics, people want to get global news, people want to get educational material, people want to get uh, sports, you know, people want to get self-help, like the beauty thing, fashion thing. What is it that is going to be the segment that has the highest need for short form mobile video. That is what they are going to have to discover because they can't do everything at one shot. And if they can find that need and do a good job of executing on that need, like sports, and then suddenly like they get 100 million people watching sports clips or music clips or, or MTV type of clips or whatever it is. Now they have found the burning need and then they will get explosive growth and then ta -ta 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 -ta, they will keep adding all the other segments. So in customer discovery, these are the most kind of overall customer discovery principles which is what are the most important things that you need to figure out for your products, right? So you know, what are the pitfalls you have to overcome? What are the success factors you've got to deliver? In a company such as this one, what do you have to do, right? So you're going to have to identify this kind, these are kinds of questions. Instead of focusing on the 80-20 rule, you focus on the 75 rule, which means that, you know, 80-20 means one out of five. 75, 70 to five means one out of? 14, right? 
14. So it's like you're really focused. Focus on that 5% that is so important for your business. Even throw away the nice to haves and focus on that 5%, that one out of 14 things that you should be focused on. Develop a plan to prove to yourself and then you'll be able to prove to others. So we've talked about how to create experiments and so on, right? And then use voice of the customer. Do you guys remember when we put up that uh, customer NX or whatever and they interviewed that woman from State Bank of India who said that I've got a mother who lives alone and you know, so it's the voice of the customer. I still remember, I don't remember what product it is, what need it is. But I remember that, you know, she's got a mother who needs care, right? So use the voice of the customer to answer these questions. Now when you do discovery, this is a very interesting uh, chart because it breaks it out as to statistical significance and credibility. What is credibility? Thing that other people can trust you with, right? Do people believe, you know, you tell somebody, you hit movie, you know. If you've never been an expert on movies, English movies or Hindi movies, you know, you say that very low credibility. But if you say that, you know, this particular uh, analyst or this particular movie critic said that this is a hit movie, you know, it's very exciting or whatever. Now, it's a high credibility movie, you know, thing. Statistical significance, you know, if you have, if, if just that particular critic, movie critic said it's great, that has some significance. But if you find that in the, on Saturday, the day the movie was launched, they were, it had the highest gross for that Saturday. Now you've got the statistical number, right? You've got actual quantitative data that that is going to be a, uh, a blockbuster, right? So you've got statistical data and you've got credibility. So in business, you'll notice that at the top of the credibility is actually getting a written commitment from a customer. LOI is letter of intent and MOU is Memorandum of Understanding. And if you, get, if you get that, high credibility. Obviously, it's not the same thing as actually money in your pocket. For money in your pocket, you go to the top right-hand corner, which is PO. If you get a purchase order, if you guys develop a product or a consulting service, and you get somebody to give you a PO and say, hey, I need three people to work on this project. I'm going to pay one lakh rupees a month for each consultant. Now, <laughs> everybody's going to say, wow, I think you have a hot st consulting startup, right? And it's, you become fundable, people get, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things you can do with a PO in the pocket. Now, what happens is that most first-time entrepreneurs believe that they can never get a PO without getting a product done. But I can tell you that most serial entrepreneurs, people are starting the company the second or third time, they won't start a company till they have a PO in the pocket. Till they get one customer to look at their PowerPoint, look at their wire model, look at their, you know, design, look at whatever that demo that they've got and say, yep, I'm actually going to give you a PO if you can, based on you delivering this particular product in six months or three months or whatever. So basically, serial entrepreneurs actually will not start a company till they get a PO in the pocket. Did the chance of success take off? right? The chances of success go up exponentially if you get PO in the pocket. Purchase order, if you get from somebody, now it's your chance of success to cough. So getting a revenue order, uh, getting real money, all that 
is like you know the best thing you can do to start your company and a lot of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley who are starting a company the second time third time they all you know for the security startup or for their or they come up with some new cloud computing equipment or or even this new TV you know when they commit to raise two billion do you think they've got some PO in the pocket they must have had some commitments right who do you think would have given them a commitment that would exponentially increase their chance of success so data is is the bottom corner bottom right right surveys public research data so when I tell you that there are two billion smartphones there's so much bandwidth so many young people so many so much viewership on YouTube etc that's statistical but what kind of PO purchase order that new TV can get which will dramatically change their fundability I personally think without that PO they can't get funded two billion dollars but they've said that they're going to raise two billion dollars so they're not stupid people so obviously they're going to they've got something hidden in their pocket tell me what it is I can make a guess but you tell me some music companies have signed up with them to provide short form video right short form music and given them an exclusive maybe okay that's a good one what is the other good one huh yeah so that's the same thing so that can be one kind of a PO what kind of other POs are there what kind of other P purchase order in your pocket you can get something that is strong commitment some advertisers could have said look you do this yep we're going to advertise with you yep that's true what else yep but that's again content yeah they can tell you what is what is succeeding what is getting the highest hits what is the turnover rate what is the actual viewer behavior all that is you know quantitative research data and all that stuff good to have nice to have but it's not killer if individuals yeah you can do that kind of validation agreed huh there he got it do you agree does anybody disagree what did he say exactly suppose new TV has made a partnership deal with Samsung or Xiaomi or Apple that their platform will be a default application available on boot up for every new device that these smartphones are launched do you agree that suddenly they've got a great opportunity to get great start for the company right so so you can see that that guy that box at the top right hand corner is how you got to be thinking you know it's not easy to get that commitment why would Samsung go ahead and put a commitment they'll say I'll give it to you but you know everybody really wants to watch Facebook videos or everybody wants to watch you know snapchat videos or Instagram videos why should I have new TV be the default app you know so it's not easy to get but you know it's the kind of advantage that entrepreneurs have to identify and then you use all your energy to target and get it right you know you go ahead and call them up and you say 
you know, you do something or the other, right? You say, okay, you know, one easy way to get Samsung or Xiaomi or somebody to give you that uh, default uh, boot up, you know, default app is what? <laughs> You're good. That's exactly right. You can say that, okay, if you do that, you can have 2% of new TV stock equity. So 2% is going to be worth $20 million. So you'll have a $20 million and you know, we expect this company to explode in value. So this 20 million can become easily 200 million in no time. So, you know, your business is going to get a $200 million kick, you know, by providing this default. So actually, just to finish, close the story on the Dropbox thing, Dropbox used to give what, uh, two gig, two, yeah, two gigabytes for free, right? Uh, and then when they went to Samsung and said, you know, can you make our app default? Samsung negotiated and said, okay, we'll make it default only if you give every Samsung user 25 gigabytes free storage. So basically Dropbox had to figure out whether 25 gigabyte free storage multiplied by 100 million users every year is something they could afford to support on the cloud, right? And how much money it would cost. And uh, I'm sure they did the calculation and figured out, you know, by the time most smartphone users can upload 25 gigabytes, might be 10 years, right? It takes a long time to upload from your smartphone all these gigabytes of storage. So even if I give 25 gigabytes, most likely people are going to use maybe one or two gigabytes or three gigabytes, right? Most on the average. And so they calculated the cost and basically their valuation exploded, but they didn't go bankrupt in the process. See, other entrepreneurs might have said, oh, 25 gigabytes, multiply that by the cost of 100 million users every year. God, there isn't that much storage available in the cloud for anybody. And they would have just walked out of, with no deal. But these guys said, we'll do the deal because no chance of people using that much, right? Because they've got the data from five years as to how much storage people are using on desktops that are connected to the internet, right? So they have some inside data that Samsung did not have. And Samsung was saying, let me ask for the moon. And these guys took it. So, you know, anyway, so sometimes as an entrepreneur, you know, uh, basically you have to figure out, you know, things that, you know, look risky, but they're really not that risky because you know some facts that somebody else doesn't know. Anyway, so. These revenues orders is what every entrepreneur should be focusing on. And as I said, most serial entrepreneurs will not start a company till they have a PO in the pocket, right? You just don't start it. You go ahead and prepare PowerPoints, you prepare demos, you prepare pilots, you go around, you know, pushing the idea and till you get people hooked on it and actually willing to commit to paying the money. So all of these nine things, nine or 10 things are very important, but for every company or every startup, it's gonna be a different one or two, three things that are impossible. For Selectica, do you think it was difficult to know what the TAM was, target market segment, burning need, it was a startup in an existing market. All of that is already figured out. I don't need to have any, uh, I don't need to do much research to do that. But, you know, my issue was going to be, you know, can I really, will customers really buy my product? Because I'm a no-name company. I've got no money to, 
you know, make the chips. So those, that, the business model, those are the issues that I'm going to have to put all my energy into. So every startup, so all of you guys will have a different set of important driver for success or risk to overcome or a common belief, right? So, yeah. So as I said that, you know, when you are successful entrepreneurs are going to be those guys who put so much effort to convince people before they have the product that you have a great product. You have to convince people you have a great product before you have it. And the entrepreneurs that can do it are the ones who are going to succeed in the, uh, with the highest probability. So, you know, you have to learn to sell what they call vaporware. You, you heard of vaporware? Huh? No, vaporware is a product that is like steam, you know, hot steam. You know, there's nothing real there, but you know, you make it real by, you know, putting a balloon around it or putting, you know, some make it make it make it feel real right so you have to be able to sell something that is your vision in, with so much convincing power that people actually say yeah take my money <laughs> you know? and, and 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 want you to get in get in it right yeah so that is so you know but you every each of you has to figure out what you're struggling with because everybody is going to have a technology problem, or a market problem, or a customer problem, or you know, you'll have a different problem to to solve, right? So you've got to know what problem you're to solve. So, and then once you figure out what problem you're to solve, it's easy. Because now it's an engineering problem. It's just how do you step by step ask the right questions and get there? And then no sitting at home. You've got to go out, and you've got to actually do some meeting people, asking questions, doing Google search, da 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 da, all kinds of stuff in order to get it there. You've got to do screenshots, fake demos, make a little, make it do a little. Um, this is kind of a nice chart to know, which is, you know, the simplest thing you, that you can provide your potential customer is screenshots. Right, just make a demo of screenshots. We did that a lot for our configurator. Then we did mock-ups. So you mock it up and say that, okay, you know, we created a car configurator. You can choose the wheels and the steering and the leather seats change and the, the leather seats change, the color of the hood changes and all kinds of stuff, right? So we create a little mock-up. Then we said prototype. Prototype is where the customer can actually use the AI rules. They can enter the, their own AI rules and run it. Then you can do an alpha version of the product. Then you can do a beta version of the product. Then you can get users to actually validate. And then you can have a product release, right? So as an entrepreneur, you can start at, you'll always start at the lowest level. You know, because initially when you come up with the idea, it's all a piece of paper. What's in your mind, right? So, and, uh, you know, when you start promoting your product, initially just try to get the list of names of customers, potential names. Then you get references. Then you get customers who can, can be references. Then you get letter of intent. Then become reused users. So, so each of them, there's a sequence to how you get there. Now the question is, how do you talk to all these people, right? I'm, I'm, now all of you guys have already started connecting with people, but use LinkedIn, social network. The best thing I've used is alumni networks. You know, the great thing is 
every medium and large company anywhere in the world, whether it's in Nigeria, whether it is in Dubai, whether it's in Kazakhstan or wherever, there is an Indian. <laughs> Somewhere there, <laughs> there are Indians who have been exported to every company in the world. And guess what? They love talking to Indians, right? So, and Pakistanis, by the way. Once we leave India, Indians and Pakistanis are friends. So, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if he's a Pakistani, you know. Uh, so just remember uh, that Indian Pakistani, you know, that increases your opportunity 50% or 30% at least by increasing the number of people that you can be friends with, right, who can work with you. So, and, and you know, it's like Indian, Pakistani, Sri Lankans, Nepalis, Bangladeshi, you know, easier to count, easier to work with. Then the next set of people that is easier to work with is Asia, Southeast Asians, right? Thai, Malaysian, you know. And then, you know, I think Chinese, and then, you know, Arabs, and then Africans, and then, you know, so, so, you know, if you can't find any Indian, look for a Pakistani. If you can't find any Pakistani, go for uh, Malaysian or Taiwanese or whoever. If you can't find a Taiwanese, then go for But the thing is that these people automatically connect with us, right? So, you know, we have to learn to connect with people. And so you use all, any and every network. It's a relentless pursuit to get to people that you can connect with. They'll pick up your phone, they'll talk to you, they'll respond to your email, and that is what you're looking for. And everybody has to do this. It doesn't matter whether you are a successful entrepreneur or a failed entrepreneur. Everybody has to do this. So no, nothing to be shy about. But then preparation is the key. You have to prepare you know, before you connect with anybody. So before I connect with anybody that you know, I've identified inside you know, even like, you know, I wanted to provide some product into British Telecom in England, you know, in Oxford or Cambridge or wherever they were. And through our Indian channels, you know, reached out there and found an Indian guy, you know, and most Indian guys have now reached at least director level, which is high enough, right? So they are very well connected and you should ask, uh, Ask Dave Deep. I think pretty much, you know, contacts are everywhere in all these corporations. And you just have to get there using any of those networking methods with, that we said. But then the question is how do you get them to become your information partner, right? So, if you just reach out to them unprepared, it'll be a very short call because all successful people are busy. So it'll be a very short call and they will not take your call the second time. That's the crazy thing. You know, you can easily be, you know, uh, spammed out uh, in, in business. If they feel that, you know, you are not somebody who's smart, who's prepared, who's uh, focused, who's going to be of value to them to connect with, who's going to be of somebody that, you know, they will get mutual benefit from while after connecting, that relationship will never mature. It'll just be a short, short thing and it's over, right? So, uh, and that's, that's a burnt, burnt relationship, right? So, you have to prepare, 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 which is you've got to First one, prepare. It's all about targeting the interviewee, landing meetings, developing a written interview guide. I would prepare for a whole day or two days before I pick up the call and talk to the British Telecom guy. I want to know, you know, which school he went to in India, what his friends are, how old he is, you know, where he lives, you know, um, what what technology he's familiar with, what uh, what as much as I can, right? So you have to figure out that everything you can about that, that person, and then you've got to e execute in that call, right? And then you've got to follow up. A lot of people do 
step one and even two, but fail in number three. Follow up means, if you don't follow up, means, you know, again, that's the end of that relationship. You know, now we've got to start from scratch again. So when you start talking to the person, this is the sequence that you start talking. First is an open-ended conversation, right? You know, discuss, you know, uh, because everybody knows lots of things where, you know, technology is going or industry is going or business is going or whatever. And so you start off with open-ended, broad questions and you listen to what they say. Then you start responding to all of that stuff with more and more detail and then you take them all the way to a letter of intent or appeal. So it's like three steps. And you'll probably be in step one and two for maybe at least half a dozen conversations. Uh, so this is kind of what you do with your data. And then if you're doing a survey, then here are some good ideas. And then, you know, you can obviously collect a lot of information from all over the place from these public documentation sources. Okay, so uh, customer discovery. This is why you do it, to answer in the voice of the customer, speak with credibility, credibility and authority that you talk to this person, important person, and you va validated your business needs. Um, how you do it, I've shown you the method. When do you do it? Now, as much as you can stand, as many calls as you can make, and then you can match your product with the market. That's the goal, right? Okay, so these are the questions that you'll be facing in the gate. And that's why you're prepare, answering those things in your assignment. You know, questions for the chief marketing officer, questions for the CTO, and questions that either person can answer. So you saw how you have to go ahead and put your pitch together for gate one. Any questions anywhere? 